You're listening to Your Daily Dungeon, a Dungeons and Dragons podcast by Your Daily Nerd. Hey, 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 adventurers! Welcome back to episode 14 of Curse of Strahd, Your Daily Dungeons. Uh, what's ongoing podcast of monumental proportion? Um, so we find adventures today walking through the forest woods, the graveyard of everything not, uh, civilization, uh, you know, some uh, strange metaphor that would sound really cool in your heads, but not allowed, uh, for a forest in Barovia. Uh, you are being led by two Vistani, uh, they have brought you to what looks to be like a small camp. Uh, there's, there can't be more than, uh, say, probably two dozen Vistani here at this camp. Uh, as you approach the camp, they all kind of look at you guys uh, with a couple different, you know, mixture of glances of wonderment and interest. Some of them kind of shooting you dirty looks. But for the most part, you kind of get a relatively warm feeling from this group of individuals as you approach. Uh, it's late in the evening, by the way. It's probably about 7 or 8 o'clock at night when, as you guys are approaching. You have not rested. You have not recovered from your previous encounter with Strahd. So, uh, as you approach this encampment, uh, I remind you that studying an engagement, while not, you know, the dumbest thing you could do, is but number two. <laughs> uh, so you approach a road uh, coming al- along the... Uh, the southeastern side of this camp and it looks like they're kind of sallied up alongside the uh, the tents and uh, the guy is bringing you along the southeastern side of this road up along the uh, the way here and he kind of brings you around to the front side of a large uh, I guess you can see there's one two three four uh, wagons like covered wagons parked around a fire and five tents of relatively the same make and size, and then one larger tent. It's about 20 feet across and 30 feet long. Or, sorry, it's 15 feet. So it's 10 feet across and 15 feet wide. I'm sorry about that. I was about to say, that's oh. a big tent. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, the Vistani are gathered around telling stories, uh, mostly kind of recounting things in their lives and things that they've seen. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't this a ritual kind of night for them? Ritual storytelling. I'm just gonna... Zardok is gonna kind of walk a little bit closer and just kind of sit cross-legged on the ground, listening. Uh, so, you notice that the road has gradually disappeared, and it's kind of replaced by, like, twisted, muddy path through the, through the trees. That's kind of what you notice as you walked up. This isn't, like, any kind of main road. This is much, much more off to the side and kind of well used by the Vistani. Um, and you know, all these, these colorful tents that kind of sit around um, each about 10 feet in diameter, and they're pitched outside of this, you know, that ring of uh, fire. Uh, you see sagging f- are, are lit within, within the tents themselves. So there are individuals inside the tents as well. And uh, near this tent, near these tents you see eight unbridled horses drinking from the river on the, uh, the northern side of the camp. Uh, you would know that this is the Il- uh, Ivlis River, Eric, from studying your maps. Okay. Uh, you hear kind of happy accordion playing as a couple of the Vistani uh, are kind of like sitting around the, uh, the the bonfire. They're all brightly clad in like nice colors, and, you know, reds and purples and yellows. And you see a footpath kind of meanders, meanders its way through the encampment um, and travels north between the river to end the forest edge. Um, you see that there's 12 men and women kind of sitting around, uh, standing and sitting around, or telling stories. Some of them are guzzling wine. There's a, a good variety of them pretty intoxicated. Okay. We were here... We got brought here. Yes. We didn't... We didn't, act, we, we didn't actually choose to come here. No. Although you were kind of following the river, looking for this encampment, I believe. Or were yeah, you we were for gonna, something. 
We were gonna camp here around it. Yeah, you remember the man that you? His name was uh, Laszlo, and his sister was Claudia. All right. Do you say anything to them as they as they approach the can uh, the approach the uh, like the main camp area? Yeah, I mean, we could. I could just be like, so, you know, we're we really just want like you know a uh, place to stay for the night, and uh, rest our heads down. We'll be uh, up and out of y'all's hair in the morning. Uh, he looks at you and he grins and says. It's not a problem, my friend. Uh, as a matter of fact, I believe there is a reason for you to be here. He kind of motions to the the largest tent, and he says, It was foretold by Madame Eva that you would appear. Perhaps she expects you, but until you feel ready to present, present yourselves, please feel free to sit, partake and drink. If you are hungry, there is food, as long as you keep our secret that we are not. Out, singing and dancing alone. He winks at you. You don't. You don't want people to know that y'all were singing and dancing. He claps you on the shoulder, looks at you, goes like, "I like your spirit." <laughs> I, I just don't see the problem with it. it you know, and who cares? Uh, the woman looks at you, and says, "Well, it's because we were supposed to be here, but we were doing it by ourselves." Ah, you rebels. Rebel scum. <laughs> uh, she kind of looks at you, Mel, and she kind of leans in and tussles your beard a bit. And she says, I like you. You make funny jokes. I she says, have, have wine. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, sure. I like wine. She kind of like spins over to Am and like reaches up and takes him by the hood and pulls his hood back and says, Relax, you are amongst friends. You are safe here as long as you do not do anything stupid. You hear that, guys? <laughs> You're safe as long as nobody does anything stupid. We're all, are we, I, are I we feel like we should all just... Are we going to go, where's DJ? Oh, shit. <laughs> Was nobody keeping an eye on the gnome? I, I usually do. Did, did he get left behind? He has short legs. Well, let's hope he catches up. Irina says, maybe he just fell in the river. Would that be so bad? Kinda. Uh, he was good at finding traps. Is it really good at finding traps if he just springs them on his face? <laughs> Look, uh, DJ is not without his flaws, but he's a valuable member of this team. She nods her head and says, well, I'm glad you think of him that way. I Hopefully, uh, I come to find him the same. You okay. probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> she laughs and says, for a dead man, you're rather funny. It's about all I got going for me right now. Uh, Claudia looks at you. She says, indeed, you are dead. What, what happened? Did you fall on your head? Um, no, I was crushed by a vine monster. She cocks an eyebrow at you as if what you said makes sense. Oh, as if it was supposed to make sense. <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, you know, I'm just as confused as you are about this whole being alive thing, so I'll let you know when I find out more. She blinks a couple times and she says, well, uh, I'm going to go attend to the horses, yes. Uh, <laughs> brother, um, do show them a good time. And uh, you see Laszlo kind of like, you know, reach into his uh, his pocket and he pulls out a, a cane pipe, and uh, and he and he lights it and he pops it into his mouth, and he says, "Oh yeah, sure, it should be my pleasure." So, <sighs> wine, anybody, or perhaps whiskey? We do have some whiskey. I have to get it out of the cart though. I definitely have some wine. Uh, you see him kind of like whistle. And uh, you see one of the guys dancing around the fires uh, turns around and he's got like several wineskins hanging from his shirt. And he looks over and he says, Are you going to just sit there and hog them all? Sure, we have guests. And he kind of looks at 
he looks at you with a, a bit of disinterest, and he says, Walter, do not look, share. And uh, you see the uh, the middle-aged man walks over a little grumpily, pulls off one of the many wineskins he has, and like, drops it into uh, Zarbdok's lap because he's still you know, cross-legged on the ground. <laughs> you see Laszlo look at him and tap a foot. Hmm. And he pulls off he pulls off two more of the several wineskins he hands off, and he hands one to Mel and he hands one to uh, Irina, and he says, "There, they are content." And he takes two wineskins he has and starts drinking for both of them as he turns around and walks away. I I start drinking a lot. <laughs> Give me a Constitution save. <clears throat> Absolutely. <laughs> that is a twelve. All right, uh, you start to convulse and shake, and uh, all of a sudden, you feel like Amnon is taking back over. Like good Amnon, or like, hey, let's be friends with Strahd, Amnon? Like good Amnon. Oh. Oh, my God. Where where are we? What do you mean? How did, how did we get here? <laughs> Again, I asked, what do you mean? <laughs> you, you, Oryx is going to overhear with... Amnon saying this, is, and he's going to say, is the wine really that good? <laughs> i got to try this wine. <laughs> uh, uh, Irina takes a sip, and she goes like, oh, it's purple dragon crush. This is good wine. I start drinking the wine. It's exactly the same kind of was inside Death House, but, like, new. <gasps> Ooh. Actions. <laughs> Amnon is very wide-eyed right now, looking around, and then hears the voice of Zarbdok from inside of his head. You fool. You know how we got here. I had to take control, otherwise you would have betrayed the group. <laughs> and does Amnon say anything back to this? No. Just still, like, looking around <laughs> wide-eyed. <laughs> He's got that nanny face. Yeah. All right. So, uh, one of the Vistani comes over and he claps you on the uh, on the arm and says, "We are telling stories. Would you like to join us?" Um. um yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. So they sit down on the uh, like a couple logs pulled up on side. And a couple of them pull up a couple of chunked up pieces of logs and stumps and set them down for you guys to sit down on. Uh, somebody actually pulls up a chair for Irina, though. All right. So after a moment, uh, you see uh, an older Vistani, probably in his 50s or so, step forward. He's got swept back, combed hair, uh, and he's got uh, a black goatee with a gray V in the center of it. <clears throat> and it blooms out into his mustache and uh, slowly fades away to the edges, giving way to black once more. Uh, he sits down and he says, Good night, my friends. I tell a story of a wizard, a vampire, and most importantly, Mount Beretox. Very interesting stories. Many years ago, a mighty wizard came to this land. I remember him like it was yesterday. He stood exactly where you all stand. He kind of motions to the group. A very charismatic man he was. He thought he could rally the people of Barovia against the devil's throne. He stared at them with thoughts of revolt and bore them to the castle in my Images of the young vampire boy, Doru, suddenly come back to your minds. Uh, the story vaguely strikes the same chord as the story Donovich told about his son. When the vampire appeared, the wizard's peasant army fled in terror. A few stood their ground, but were never seen again. Once again, he makes eye contact with the group, specifically with Mel. Oh. 
The wizard and the vampire cast spells at one another. The battle flew from courtyard to courtyard, a Ravenloft to a precipice overlooking the falls. He motions back to the water behind you. I saw the battle with my own eyes. Thunder shook the mountainside. Great rocks tumbled down upon the wizard. Yet by his magic he survived. Lightning struck from the heavens! And again he stood his ground. But when the devil's rod fell upon him, the wizard's magic could not save him. He goes quiet and he looks at the fire. You can hear the crackling as he's building suspense or attempting to do so. He looks back up and he says, I saw him, you know. I thrown a thousand feet to his death. I climbed down to the river to search for the visit the body. You know, because you probably had some nice magical things. And uh, I, a man of of upper color and class, wanted to ensure that those would go to someone who could make use of them. In the way, I searched for the body. You know, for the values, but also to, to bury him. But the river Ilves had already spirited him away. In short, the devil Strad is no easy prey, not even for a great wizard of the Sword Coast. He strikes an eye with Mel. I feel like he's talking to me. <laughs> you hear one of the Vizani Vizan 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 go up and he says, But what was his name? Surely this great wizard has a name where you're just making it up. And he says, I don't know, I didn't ask him. He came here looking for trouble, and he died to Strahd. Like all those who look for trouble when fighting Strahd. Hmm. Irina, Irina shifts uncomfortably in her, in her seat and leans over to, uh, to Nork and says, Well, this story is kind of in some weird tones. I wonder if, uh, if they've got any good food. Uh, Nork's gonna say, uh, I agree, I'm starving. And he just kind of gets up to go look for some food. Uh, as Nora turns to leave, the man that was telling her says, Wait, wait, I have a question for men of pointed ear and... and dappled skin. You are no man and no elf. Pray tell, what does a hobgoblin like himself find in a land like Barovia? Norik's gonna pause for a second and he's gonna say needed by uh, these people I'm surrounded by you are aided I enjoy fighting accompanied by such gentlemanly folk hmm. I wouldn't be gentlemanly but close enough Speaking of not gentlemanly, where's DJ again? <laughs> I, I, I assume he just got lost. Let this be a test to him. Let this be a test to him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He'll find his way back. If it was meant to be. He sits down and he says, So tell me. Have you any other questions about my stories, my brothers and sisters? Or even you strangers, new to this camp? Surely you must like the story. No, yeah, it's a, it's an excellent story. Well told. Yeah. So, what kind of wizard was he? He says the mightiest of kinds, one of great evocation. And even great conjuration. A man of legend, they say, from Sword Coast. Well. Mel, roll a history check at advantage. Alright. You get your dice with you, right? Yes, I do. Oh, nat 20. Yeah. Uh, 
Blue so, baby. your recollection strikes a note with you that you you immediately recognize that this story pretty much coincides with the disappearance of the great Mordekainen. Oh. Uh. <laughs> okay. Almost to the letter and and the fact that he's been missing for the exact amount of time that he mentioned in accordance to you were probably at some point aware of what he was studying being with yourself that other greater intellects oftentimes make for good choices of study make sense yeah i don't know if that means anything that mel kind of might be the wizard subject of the story but lore lore wise that's a pretty big wizard yeah a, that's a pretty pretty big wizard right there um yeah I'm not gonna tell this guy who it was <laughs> well what what is Mel's re I, I I think I think his reaction to to that uh is probably like he gets a little wide-eyed uh like Straw beat water kind of. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then he's like, "Well, I don't think any creature is unbeatable, uh, even by an excellent wizard. Uh, an excellent wizard, the right wizard, could beat Straw, given the right tools." The Vistani, as a group, all laugh. You hear one lean forward and say, Did you see the last party that came through that thought they could challenge Strahd? Says one man, and another says, Yes, yes, I remember, yes, I, I, I remember. They sent a dragon, a man, an elf, and a gnome. The gnome's body split in half. The man is drunk, hiding in Barovia. Elf has wandered off in the woods, hiding from her people, and the dragon failed in battle. All great adventures in their own right. You come to them following their footsteps, and you think yourself different? Oh. Oh. Let's make something clear here. We, we didn't come to this land because we heard about uh, an evil vampire. No. We were tricked into coming here. We have no choice in being here. I don't even want to confront Strahd. I'm merely stating that a wizard with the right tools, with the right skill set, could defeat him. Irina, who's been pretty quiet this entire time, looks over at you, Mel, and says, I think you could do it. This, this send about me. She looks back and says, "Nor, you're off. technically a wizard, right?" Of, I of start sorts. chuckling. I start chuckling. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Like, technically, laugh, laughs in warlock and wizard. <laughs> I look at uh, I look at Mel and I say, "Double seeing in the dark." Oh. oh. He got you with a low blow. Guess who's getting put the light spell on him now? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a punishment. <laughs> so you see uh, Claudia kind of step forward and uh, she sits down and she's like puts this large string instrument that she had in front of her. Uh, at the original camp you found her in, in front of her. She pulls out an actual bow this time, and she sits down, and she starts playing a tune on it that's slow and melancholy, and uh, set to a 6-8 beat. Uh, you feel the pulse moving. To... Feels very contrast to something that is typically a dance. Uh, you see the uh, Vistani begin to hum a tune in uh, uh, the Barovian language 
the tune kind of is very mellow and oddly beautiful, but in a almost melancholy tone. Um, you see Lazla come up behind you humming the tune. Uh, let's see. Davros. Uh, and he puts his hand on your shoulder and says, Madam Eva would like to see you now. Uh, I I don't know what I would be doing at this point. I guess just kind of looking around, but I, I turn and... Well, no, I, let's say I've been sitting. I, I get up and what was, what was the name he said? Madam Eva. I just kind of nod. She, he motions to the whole group, meaning like you as in like the formative of all of you. Oh, that makes sense. I was yeah. kind of confused. I was like, I'll just go with it. All right, that makes more sense. Uh, so, as you guys kind of gather your things up, you hear uh, the tune switch meter. And you hear uh, one of the Barovian women start going, la la la, la la la, la la la. I think it's funny um, that, that you're singing this and like it keeps cutting out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you in your room keep singing, <laughs> but it cuts out like notes, so it's weird. <laughs> Oddly functioning. <laughs> the wonders the wonders of music silences music as well as notes <laughs> doesn't really truly matter the melody wasn't super important just know that there is a mildly melancholy melody just know that it's going to be the key to a puzzle later on that we're not going to be able to solve now <laughs> yep because the oh, mic shit. cut out and we didn't know all the notes <laughs> I went to an escape room that had a puzzle like that and everybody in in my group was like super stumped and I was like I, I, I remember I was just I just like cracked my knuckles and I was like ah, get this <laughs> it was a melody yeah it was like it was like you, you pulled a you pulled a string and it played a little melody and then you had to like play these drums in the in the right order and like match the tune. Oh, that's really simple. Yeah, right. Everybody else was like, "That would have taken uh, that would have taken like thirty minutes for us." Wow. Good job, Bert. <laughs> <laughs> that music um, degree really coming in handy. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll tune some other point because I don't want to I don't want it to be completely irrelevant. Uh, it's an actual Russian. Um, a Russian folk song. I'm just not going to use the melody because I can't speak Russian. Well, I can't. I'm not going to use the words. I don't speak Russian, but it's an actual Russian melody. So, uh, you guys gather things up and head over to the tent. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, as you guys approach the tent, you see magic flames cast a reddish glow over the interior of this tent. Uh, and as you pull the flap aside, it reveals a low table covered in a black velvet cloth. And you see glints of light seem to flash from a crystal ball on the table as a hunched figure peers into its depths. As the crone speaks, her voice crackles like dry weeds. At last! You'd have a life! Cackling bursts, uh, cackling laughter bursts like mad lightning from her withered lips as she rocks back in her chair and her spindly looking fingers kind of like clap the table in excitement. Uh, who enters first? I guess Davros. <laughs> yeah, Davros is the one he grabbed. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so Davros, you poke your head into the, uh, yeah, the, the entrance, and she looks at you and she says, Davros, is this correct? I bow a little bit. Yeah? Yeah? She says, A good elf. Most interesting. You have cousin here. I'm sure you would like to meet them. They are interesting peoples. Okay. 
You, can, you can tell by looking at Davros's face that he's like not really kind of curious by her uh, just the way she speaks and puts emphasis on words. Sure. Uh, so trailing behind him, I assume. Uh, she looks at you, Nork, and she says, The Hobgoblin Nordic. It is a pleasure to meet a warrior of skill and prowess. Perhaps. It's like the corner of his mouth kind of turns up when she says that, and he just kind of goes, oh, The pleasure's all mine. Uh, she motions to says, Clan Forsaken, I see. Have you adopted a new name? In the back when she says this and uh this would probably be the first time anyone being removed from his clan um looks at her confused and just says uh Obrid. she nods her head and says it takes more strength to respect life than it does to take it. As such, you are deserving of it. She gives an, an about it. We have a room at my table. For another second, kind of looks down his, the uh, the kind of, kind of had a couple of seconds ago has shifted dramatically, and he, you know, as he looks down, he just says, "Yeah," and he takes a seat. Uh, next comes in uh, Watt, and she looks at Watt, and she says, A man of many words, Watt Kantir. Would you like me to fix that? F fix, fix what? Your hearing. Uh, can you? I can, but you may not like it. Well, what does that mean? She, she, like, picks up her hand, and she draws one motioning for you to come to her. I, like, slowly do. She says, lean forward, though, young man. I am old. Uh, oh, okay, I do lean forward. And she leans up, she takes her hands, and she slaps both the sides of your ear, boxing them. <laughs> I'm, I'm... You experience intense pain for a few moments. I'm just like taken aback. Like, what the hell did you just do? You you feel your left ear and your right ear pop suddenly, and sound becomes more clear to you for a moment. I'm like, wait, did that actually work? She says yes, but uh, at the cost. What what cost? You feel you feel black blood, or you, you feel blood drip out your ears, and everyone sees black blood come out of his ears. Oh, good. Uh, oh. uh, uh, at the cost of one of your eardrums, it, it, should you ever uh, need that fixed, um, you'll be fine. The other one is not bad, but I definitely ruptured that one over there. But magically, your ears work fine. But uh, should anyone ever despair that magic, you will be permanently deaf in that uh, left ear. Oh, oh no. <laughs> um, could you teach me this spell in case that happens? She laughs and says. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. And she blinks at you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like looking around at everyone else, just seeing if they're as confused as I am. You're all alone on this. <laughs> <laughs> I know the right thing to say. I'm not going to say it, though. <laughs> Um, <laughs> do, you, do you say anything? Do you say anything to her? I'm like, um, did did you just teach it to me by blinking? She says no, and squints at you like you're the stupid. One. <laughs> um, can you teach it to me, please? No, I will not. <laughs> you asked if she could, not if she would. <laughs> I'm like, uh, can I pay you to teach me this? She looks at you and she says, My dear, 
I have many things in this world. Money is not one that I need. Hmm. Is there anything else you would like? <laughs> For you to take a seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> she says, look at you and she says, it is not a wonder Strad killed you first. <laughs> <laughs> She uh she looks at everybody probably because everyone's amused by this. She says, "It is because he has the purest soul, not because he's annoying. It is that as well, <laughs> but because he has a good, kind heart." If that was the case, he would have killed DJ first. No, no, he does. He he he, he, he pities idiots. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, see, I'm not an idiot. I'm just lawful good. She looks over at uh. She looks over at uh, at Mel as she steps into the tent and she says, The broken one, Mel. Uh. Do you even use your last name anymore? I look, okay. None of that. No. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just stop it. No. She don't like that. <laughs> she chuckles and she says, for one with such clever words and more meaning behind them than the average person here at the stable, you do not ever utter the words that would change the one's heart around you to respect you as a leader. Why hold back? You know, I, I, I didn't come in this tent to get a life lesson here, okay? You, you wanted to see us, right? You yes, yes, up. fine, fine. Take a seat, take a seat. I will not bother you with your pasts. I will bother you with your futures, as it is something I have seen. Where is the gnome? Uh, we think he got lost. <laughs> he's he's you, you small, see a, he's easy to lose. You see her lean forward, and uh, she, like, rubs the orb for a couple seconds. She goes like, oh, that's nasty. Oh, my goodness. Yo, I found him. He's fine. Uh, he should not be playing with bears, though. <laughs> what? <laughs> just, Amnon just takes his index finger and his thumb and just, like, rubs the bridge of his nose furiously and just goes, <laughs> I'm just like, I knew I should have carried him the whole way here. Somebody needs to get, like, a baby Bjorn for him and just, like, stick him in there <laughs> from place to place so that way we know that he's not going to get in trouble. A baby Bjorn. <laughs> and know me Bjorn. Uh, let's see here. Did she miss anybody other than... She didn't, she didn't say anything to me. Ah, right. You were the last one the door. So she looks at Amnon and she says, The man with twin souls. You are twice what Thrad wishes he could be. She chuckles, leans back, and says, Perhaps that is why he took some small butt of you. Yeah, he took my fucking spade. She looks and says, Would you like me to fix that? Yeah, sure. And I'll just walk over, and <laughs> assuming that it's just going to be nothing. I'm just kind of show her my tail. Uh, she looks at it, cackles, and says, I, I asked if you'd like me to, not if I could, not that I could. <laughs> oh, take a seat, take a seat. I can do nothing for that. That was just a missing body part. <laughs> Amnon is mad. <laughs> <laughs> she says, perhaps you have the most interesting of all backstories, best, whatever you'd like to call it. Madam Ava does not mince words. You are of special making. And perhaps even more special aims. What would the man with two souls do if they could both sit at the same table and speak as one? May I do something? Uh, sure. You see her uh, reach into the crystal. Uh, you see uh, what looks to be fingernails grow as she pierces the orb with her fingernails and she pulls out. You, Amnon, you feel like your consciousness is being tugged for a moment, and uh, you guys see that one of the empty chairs uh, where Amnon's head would kind of relatively be. You see a, a ghostly figure slowly kind of be pulled free, 
and suddenly a ghost is now seated beside Amnon in the seat next to him. Uh, and it looks to be like a, a silhouetted uh, with must be Zarbdok. Meat. Um, he is uh, not free of body, but he has a voice at table. Is this the guy you talk to all the time? See, I told you I'm not making shit up. Yes, yeah, this, this annoying guy has to share totally it all, all the fucking time. Hey, you stay out of this. This is not for you. <laughs> you should be up here, not right there. Oh, blah, blah, blah. This is what I hear every single day. It's not Madam, like we all need, like, couples counseling here. Madam Ava cackles and says, <laughs> It is funny, because... Oh, oh wait, actually, I'll stop. That's... Eight. Spoilers! <laughs> and Mel. I gotta say, though, it's... It's <laughs> it's nice only having one voice in my, set, my head, and it's my own. Oh my god, peace and quiet at last. Before Zorbdark replies, she says, I did not take you out for you to, to bicker face to face. I pulled him out so that he may respond to the various things I am about to tell all of you. But lastly, she turns her gaze to Irene, who's been standing by the tent entrance kind of quietly, and says, You have the most interesting of all connections to everyone here. You share a soul. She points to Amazon. He is a man of two souls. Points to Mel, a man with what the reins of a soul. Points to Norik, a man with a soul divided. And points to Daver, and the man with a wandering soul. And then finally points to uh, Watt and says, and the man whose soul is hostage for the very place you reside. Do you now see why Strahd has brought you here? It is because you all have unique and different beings. A soul not added to his collection in Barovia. She leans in her chair, waiting for you to say something. Any of you. You know... This is... weird. Yeah, I... <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't know about this. I, I don't know about this, guys. I, mm, I don't like this woman. I really don't. I... She says. It, she she interrupts Amnon. And says the point is for you not to like me. The point is for you to understand what it is I tell you and process the information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do not lie to you. I would not bring you here with my, she kind of looks at the uh, door and she says, be God, Laszlo. And you see him flit away from the tent. She says, with my adopted grandchildren, do not have them lure you here for me to simply kill you or have Strahd spy on you. I have news and reasons to bring to you. You want to know why you are in Barovia? Now you don't like me. Well, I'm sorry. It's not my fault. All right. You you know why we're here. So we're you're just telling us we're here because we're Strahd's little puppets, right? That's what you just said. You are it you are the exotic collections to add to his masterpiece of Barovian torture space. I don't know what's so hard to conceptualize about him being a great evil that must be quelled. Yeah, he does seem kind of like a twisted fuck. He was not always like. He was a good man. I saw you read about him, Mel. You must know he is not always bad man. Okay, so if you know why we're here, what should we do if we're not okay with being a part of his collection? She says, there are only two ways out of Barovia. Mary into Vistani, and your kids escape, and your genes escape, and then there, you know, there's that. And the second is through Strahd, either by curing him of his madness, killing him from his madness, or some third doctrine I have not thought of yet. I am not great seer, just a seer. 
she says if you want i can help you with the second option of putting strad to rest either by killing him curing him or something else if you do not want my help the tent is there she points to the doors well, it's like very curious about this curing option, but is going to let her continue. No, debating getting up. Irina, who's been pretty quiet this whole time, leans forward and says, You said that we're all connected because of our souls. What do you mean, my soul? How is mine any different than the average Barofian? She says, My dear, you are Strat's love reincarnated. When you pass in Barovia, your soul does not leave this place. You would know this, right, What? You have seen the trapped individuals here? Of course. Starting to notice them more now that I am one. She nods and says, You are Tatiana, reborn. Strads to love. The more he reminds you of it, the quicker it will come to you. You will remember with time. But, so much lies on what happens to you and that you are the first adventuring group to actually get Irina away from Strad. that even now he threats looking that you will do something to her. Irina laughs and says, they could barely get away from Strahd. What are they going to do to me? They're not evil people they just want to leave you're not actually going to do anything right she looks over at like nork and Watt. i mean if we can help one more person in our attempt to escape we might as well <laughs> say you tell me how to kill the bastard and And what? <laughs> oh, I just cut out, so I didn't hear anything. <laughs> Dylan. Dylan, you there? Here. Yeah, you're cutting out real bad, man. Really bad. You said something about kill him or or kill him and and what said, I said um you tell me a way to kill him happen that, that happened yeah, you're, you're still you're still cutting out pretty bad man I got the general idea of what you said you said show me how to kill him and I'll make that happen I think that's what he said Pretty much to a T, I think that's what he said. What he said. So, she shakes her head. She says, "Despite what you may believe, I'm not interested in Strad's death. Unless it is necessary, I'm more interested in returning the man who deserves his life back to what he once was. Believe it or not, I know what Strad was like." before he became the man he is. So uh, you roll, do know roll, how to cure him. Roll insight checks on that on that statement. Twenty one. Nineteen. Eight. A fourteen. So <clears throat> no I'll roll for one for Irene. So what type of a check was this? I couldn't hear you. Insight. Ah, that makes sense. What did Davros get? Give me a 20, not natural. It's a 13 plus 7. Okay, so... Basically, I think it was... Watts, Amnon, and Davros. You hear uh, her say this, and it occurs to you that while she is old, 
She's not telling you everything about herself. She's being intentionally vague with that statement. She must be older than what she's implying. I'm I'm gonna be like, so if you know him from before, then you must know a way to change him back, right? She shakes her head says only theories. Oh. But mostly ideas on what Strahd has attempted to keep himself away from. I know of four things that Strahd fears more than death. And those are? You see her uh, reach underneath, underneath the table and dig around and do like what looks like, like a sack beside her. And she pulls out what looks to be like a deck of cards. And she sets the deck on the uh, table, and you see her lift her hand, and you see the deck lift itself up very slowly, and magically start to shift around before readjusting itself, and setting back down on the ground. And she says, I hear here fortune, or at least a semblance of where and what Strada fears. And... Through divining through my crystal ball here, I can tell you where to find these items. I'm not gonna lie, this is out of character. When you said she pulled out a deck of cards at first, my first thought was deck of many things, and I was like, oh no. <laughs> my <laughs> first thought was, oh yes. Let's see. Seven of swords. Seven of stars. So she sets out uh, what looks to be like five cards and a plus symbol. So there's one, two, three, four, and then a card in the center. Does that make sense? Yeah. And she slides them to the table. She looks at you and she says, I have here what I suppose you could say is your start, where you can begin to find things that will make Strad fear you. She uh, taps the card and she says, This card tells of history, knowledge of the ancient will, help you better understand your enemy. Find this first. This will tell you of who Strahd was and what he believes. She flips the first card over. Uh, the first card is, if you're looking at it like it's a compass, it's the western side of the plus. Make sense? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Let's assume that you're all cards in the same direction. The table is round, but you guys are all seated in a way that the top card is fate, like the north card is, is closest to her, and the four is closest to Irina. Mm -hmm. He's on the opposite end of the table. So the western side flips and reveals the first card. And you see what looks to be like a jester. And half of his face is that of a jester. And the other half looks to be like a hobgoblins type face. Uh, with like a massive cavernous eye. Whited out like it's blind. And uh, he's wearing a jester's costume on the other side as well but this one has more innate workings on it. Uh, one side looks to be human, the other side looks to be absolutely horrendous. Like a very caricatured hob hobgoblin. Hmm. Uh, next, she pulls out a... Uh, she says, This card tells of a powerful force for good and protection. A holy symbol of great hope. She, uh, the card, and, uh, let's see. That is your one of glyphs. Gonna be... One of glyphs, where is it? It is a monk. You see a man carrying tankard, uh, and he's heavy set. And he's got two, uh, he's bald save for the center patch of hair and two, like, 
side clumps of hair that stick off the sides of his head. And he's carrying a tankard in one hand and a keg in the other. And there are leaves circling around him. And this one reads, The treasure you seek is hidden behind the sun in the house of a saint. Uh, for the record, if you're not writing them down, you're going to definitely want to write them down. So the first one, by the way, she says the first fortune, the seven of stars, which was an illusion is a man is not what he seems. He comes here in a carnival wagon. Therein lies what you seek. So carnival wagon is what... Carnival wagon is the main mm -hmm. thing. That's the first one. That's that's, that's the, the, the item that tells of Strahd's history. Okay. Uh, Anyways, a treasure behind the sun. Yeah, a treasure lies in the... You see is hidden behind the sun in the house of a saint. Ian, is that sun like S-U-N or S-O-N? S-U-N. Kind of like, like, the, like the like the morning lord almost. Yeah. And that was a holy symbol? Yes. Neat. I need one of those. A holy symbol of great hope is what it's described as to her. Or what she describes it as, rather. Uh, so she pulls up the next card, which is... So that the second card was at the northernmost part of it. The third card is now at the easternmost part of the compass, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and she pulls up the seven of swords, which looks to be like a hooded man with a sword placed in front of him. Uh, and let's see here. It says, I see a faceless god. He awaits you at the end of a long and a winding Deep in the mountains. She kind of taps the card and says, This is a card of power, strength. It deals of a weapon of vengeance, a sword made of pure sunlight. Seems useful. Yeah, especially okay. fighting vampires. She flips over the next card, which is at the bottom, the southernmost point. And uh, let's. This card looks to be different from the others, and it bears uh, a different suit to it almost. Uh, it's not a sword or a glyph or a star it looks to be like it has its own symbol uh, you see a crown uh, in the four corners and the symbol is a ghost it's a, a, a withered looking man holding a uh, like a lantern in one hand and his hands look decrepit and uh, he has pointed ears like that of an elf and he's hunched over, kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like what's his face from uh, Christmas Carol. Yeah. Ebenezer Scrooge. Yeah, he's hunched over like Scrooge. She taps it. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not right. No, no, it is. I'm sorry. Uh, she says, "I see a fallen paladin." Of a fallen order of knights. He lingers like a ghost. She looks up and says, Perhaps you have already met him. Mm. 
You mean the guy that got backhanded through a church wall? Of course, Salad and the Paladin. God damn it. <laughs> she flips the card over and says, This card has many faces. As though there might be many that strut fears. She says, The significance of this card is that it sheds light on one or many who will help you greatly in the battle against darkness. She, see, she leans back. Perhaps it is best for you to seek out all adventurers. All those who have come to find Strahd. You have found one. Find many. She says, in the final card, Your enemy is a creature of darkness, whose powers are beyond mortality. This card will lead you to him. She reaches forward and taps her hand on the card and it magically flips over and she says the executioner you see the hooded man in Barovia uh, the one who was looking at you guys in the town wait the, the, the executioner that was in the town yes Okay. She said, Strahd has many disguises and watched you from the moment you stepped into his domain. But it is here that you will confront him. Irina kind of cocks an eyebrow and says, Do you mean to tell me that the city executioner has been Strahd this entire time? Uh, Madam Ava looks at him and says, do you not think that this is a befitting role for Strahd? Judge, jury, executioner, all rolled into one. Hmm. Why has he got to hide it? <clears throat> she uh, chuckles and says, It is not that he hides. It is that he likes to take personal enjoyment. And it's hard to do that when people run from you instead of deliver the bodies to you to kill. Zarvdok kind of pipes up and says sometimes there's power in knowing what others don't want you to know. A strength and anonymity. Yes. Precisely that, Zarvdok. But you would know about that. Amnon kind of like like looks at like the vague shape of Zarbok and just kind of the thought enters in his head again. I saw I saw a thought that it's not heard by anyone besides Amnon for once. <laughs> Does Zarbok say anything at the jab? No. She uh back in her chair and she says a another thought. This the uh, location you encounter Strahd. You may fight him here. A great battle will ensue. But you must know that a vampire cannot die away from his coffin. You see her whisk the card and all the cards kind of flutter in the air and come back onto the table and form card castle in the shape of Castle uh, Castle Ravenloft. And she says, you must descend into the castle's catacombs. To put an end to Strahd there. Once all is said and done. Defeat him once, but then partake upon his castle's evils and see that he is dead forever. Or cured, she looks over at Watt. <laughs> Just like give her a thumbs up. If uh, yeah, I don't think that we need to be saving a man like that. <laughs> He's made his choice about who he is. There's no saving that.
Roll an inside check. Which one? Ev Near him. E everyone? Mel, sa Mel says it aloud. Yeah. yeah. You want uh, me to roll it? Everyone can roll it. 26. Was... 11. Fuck me. 18. That's pretty good. Why, do you, why are you upset about it? I was saying that 23. About, uh, 26. Yeah, 26. Should I roll, Should I roll separate 23. Insight? Should I roll separate insight checks for Amnon and Zardok, or just one? You can roll them for both. Okay, Amnon was an 11. Zardok was a 5, so it's not like it matters too much. Pretty much everyone that rolled above a 15 would immediately see... After Mel says that Straw's essentially better off being killed, Madam Ava's face looks to be upset. She, she looks distraught, almost, at the, at the comment. I don't care. I've got theories as a player. I mean, no time like the present. I mean, I, I there's things well, that I don't think that Amnon would have put together yet. Watt's gonna ask how she knew him in the past. She looks at you and has a soft says. Let us just say that I used to work in the castle. All right. Watch, well, just gonna nod Ooh. to her. I rolled an insight check on Irina, and you see Irina kind of lean forward, and she says, "Oh, I remember your face. You were at the wedding." Madame Ava says, "Yes, but I think it's time for you to go." What wedding? Irina leans back and says, I think my wedding? What? Not like uh, you, 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 like past you. She nods her head, yes, at whoever, whichever one said it. Okay. That was Amnon. Yeah. <clears throat> she nods her head and she goes like, yeah, I think so. You were married? I think... To Strahd? I don't remember. Or whoever Strahd was before he was Strahd? Madam Ava, Ava says, All will come to air in time. The Asantorus better off not known until they must be known. <clears throat> Hippie nonsense. Hippie nonsense? Yep. <laughs> She says, what's the matter, Vizard? Do not believe in divination magic? Oh, I believe in divination magic. But... I don't know. You're obviously not telling us everything. Hell, I don't even know if we can even trust you. I am not sure that they can trust you. Would you yourselves secrets from each other. You cannot begin to defeat Strahd until you trust one another with your life. Petty secrets are what made Strahd what he is. Think about that. You see her lean forward and she kind of blows on the crystal ball. All the lights in the room vanish. Or rather go out and are briefly lit after a moment. Uh, those of you with dark vision would also just kind of like your eyes would start to adjust and come back, and she's not there anymore. Yeah. Of course. Lovely. Uh, you hear the front flap of the tent open up, and uh, you see Lab again with uh, some wine, and he says, Come on! We are putting wine on the cows! <laughs> Is that like a, a saying around here, or are you literally pouring wine on cows? He pulls the the, uh, the tent open a little bit, and you see a very fast woman having wine poured on her. Ah. <laughs> yeah, Mel just stands up, and he's like, I'm going to bed. Has Zardok re-entered my Amnon's body? Yes. 
Okay. But actually, Ian, I'm not going to bed. Lily? I'm going to copy a spell into my spell book. Well, yeah. Davros uh... actually goes to bed. <laughs> What's going to ask Mel if he, like, knows the spell that did this to my ears? Um, I'm gonna like look at your ears. I'm gonna like look inside and yeah, I know the spell. <laughs> <laughs> Let me roll a bluff check. Hold on. <laughs> Let's see. Seven. Oh, sh Should I roll against this? <laughs> no, nah, you just you he just roll. Convincing lie is. Oh lord. <laughs> So, so I think that he knows the spell. Well, let's see what he rolled. I rolled roll a 17 on my bluff check. It's a pretty convincing lie. I'm just going to kind of go with it. And I'm going to uh, say, well, I still want her to teach me just in case. If you can find her. Good point. Um... Uh, so we're pretty much out of time for the session. So, uh, unfortunately, DJ didn't get any fortune tellings or anything fancy so uh, told because he's out playing in bear shit. So, I guess we'll have to catch him next time. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, you, you guys did write down all. Gave right. I gave five individual. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm just... Those those are the most relevant thing to take from from here. I'm gonna yeah. take a picture of my drawing. But, but Ian, did I get to copy down my spell? What spell are you copying down? Spiritual weapon. Spirit weapon. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Nice. It's an awesome spell. So, yeah, I just want to, I just want to copy that down. Actually, I, I will stay up all night. Doing doing stuff because I I think that only takes like two hours. Okay. Uh, so we are out of time for this episode. Uh, we'll catch you guys next week on your daily dungeon to continue with the characters and their adventures with the Vistani and their travel to the city of Valaki. One day down, uh, a full week's worth of travel is not a safe thing to do in in the country of Barovia. Uh, fortunately, we have the thing called fast travel which will teleport you guys miles at a time <laughs> uh, I look forward to, to getting to some of the more fun content and to actually show you guys what Dietrich got himself involved in oh god thank you guys so much for listening and we'll catch you next week on your daily dungeon proudly presented by your daily nerd keep rolling